All right, well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start here with this view uh, from the Garden Patch site, which is in Dixie County, um, which I'll talk quite a bit about today. Uh, and it's located in Horseshoe Beach, which, um, you know, most of the time doesn't make national news, except for about six weeks ago, unfortunately, Hurricane Adalia came through and, and really uh, ravaged the town. Um, so Horseshoe Beach today is, is uh, a little over 160 residents. And from what we know of the archeology, span there were probably at least as many people living there about 1,500 years ago. Um, because this was the site of, a, of an early village. And what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, more broadly is some of what we know about early villages uh, on the Gulf Coast of Florida and also how they, uh, how they related to villages uh, kind of beyond this region. So beginning about 1,800 years ago, um, villages became really widespread. And, and they weren't the first villages in the region. There's certainly villages that go back to the late archaic um, more than 4,000 years ago. But it's really the first time that they become, became widespread and, and maybe even most people lived in, in larger villages. Uh, so it's this major kind of social phenomenon. And uh, there are important commonalities between these villages. <clears throat> and and these, some of these are kind of depicted in um, in this painting here. Um, so they were organized around a central plaza that was cleared. Uh, they take kind of a, a U-shaped or a, a circular kind of distribution with houses around the plaza. Um, and we identify uh, the shape of these sites oftentimes by the configuration of their, of their midden, of their trash piles that we think is near these houses. And then the largest villages also included uh, constructed mounds of, of earth or shell. And, uh, and most of the mounds are uh, a few meters high or, or less, but some of them are really uh, major constructions like this mound at, um, at Letchworth, which is just a few miles west of here, which is 16 meters high. And many sites like Letchworth have, uh, have multiple mounds uh, so on the left is a um, kind of fanciful drawing of Letchworth um, by architect William Morgan. Um, but the point is that some of these sites have multiple mounds uh, that are incorporated into the village plan and, and kind of surround plazas. So mounds for archaeologists are really important as, uh, as evidence of uh, collective action, the, the ability to organize large groups of people towards a, a common cause. And, um, and so the purpose in, in a lot of these cases is, uh, is largely centered around uh, religious and, and ritual practices. So mound centers like these, uh, they weren't only the sites of villages, they also drew in a lot of people from afar to build mounds and, and to uh, participate in feasts and probably to exchange uh, various things. And so we call these places that have both village components and also constructed mounds uh, and the associated activities. We call them civic ceremonial centers. <clears throat> and, and it's important to keep in mind that this is a really dynamic time. Uh, really anywhere in the world where, the, where early villages kind of arise. Because people have to come up with, uh, with solutions to kind of novel challenges. Um, so there's a scalar issue that arises uh, with, with more people. Uh, than you can regularly talk to um, all the time. And, um, and so new solutions to communication and conflict resolution and political organization are required. Uh, and then population growth often accompanies settled village life. And so that kind of exacerbates um, some of these problems. And also there's requirements for intensifying production, um, to, to have more food, managing resources, and, um, and managing uh, the environment. So, um, so each of these are kind of novel problems with the first, the emergence of the first villages. And a lot of archaeologists say that really during the first millennium after the first villages arise, um, we often find uh, that there's kind of provisional solutions to these challenges. And, and that makes the first villages kind of unstable. So it's kind of a, an interesting social experiment in a way. Um, so with that as a little bit of context, 
uh, I'm, I'm going to take you through this social experiment uh, on the northern Gulf Coast and, and adjacent regions and address some of the, the most pertinent questions for early villages. So how did the, the early villages form? How were they organized? How did early villages relate to their peers? And, uh, and why did they uh, decline or transform or disband? Um, and just to lower your expectations a little bit, I'm, I'm probably not gonna give totally satisfactory answers to these questions, but it's sort of, I, I'm gonna provide some hints, I think. Um, and so the, these blue uh, labels here, these blue triangles on the map um, represent civic ceremonial centers, and it's not inclusive. These are just sites that have been part of uh, studies um, that have been conducted in, in my research program. Um, but I want to call your attention to um, Garden Patch here in Horseshoe Beach, which I'll talk a lot about, and Spring Warrior, which is in Taylor County near Perry, and then also um, Kolomoki in, in southwest Georgia, in early county Georgia, uh, is going to become important as well. So we're going to start with origins. So how did these early villages form? And I'm going to kind of set the scene going to Garden Patch first in Horseshoe Beach. Um, so there's, there's a climatic optimum that, um, that's coincident with um, these early villages uh, in the northern hemisphere. It's known as the Roman Warm Period. And it's warmer and wetter in Florida uh, generally. So with, um, with my postdoc, Paulette McFadden, who, who worked with me in 2015, she's now at um, Division of Historical Resources, um, we did some cores uh, to understand the history of the environment immediately kind of surrounding the site and, and also within the site. So there's a freshwater pond out there, which is this really good in, environmental uh, record. And we can see from the cores there, um, you can barely see this, maybe uh, this kind of dark area in this, um, in this rendering of the core is where muck began to accumulate in the, in the pond, in the sediments there, and that dates to about 400 BC. So that shows sort of the first, uh, the first time that water was, uh, was regularly in that pond and there's organic uh, material from, from aquatic plants and algae and stuff accumulating on the bottom. Uh, and then we actually see uh, this sand horizon uh, that we are pretty sure dates to the time when there's intensive occupation at the site and people are building mounds and they're mobilizing all the sediment and it winds up in the pond. So there's this sand lens, basically sand eroding from terrestrial areas at the site. And then we have a, um, a date that sort of caps that when it returns to this kind of uh, peat deposit where there's organics accumulating again. Um, by about 700 AD, and so that's um, sort of shows the, the intensive occupation of the site. Um, and then we did cores in the salt marsh <clears throat> adjacent to the site, and there's, there's kind of a, um, a dramatic um, transgressive event where, where um, shoreline uh, gets reconfigured with sea level rise, and that's dated um, in a few places. Further south on the, the um, in Wakasasa Bay, um, uh, it was dated to um, somewhere in the first few centuries AD, and we dated it locally here to happening by at least the beginning of the first century AD. Um, and so this is, uh, this is pretty interesting uh, for us because uh, we know that this, this event that reconfigured the shoreline predates the village by at least 200 years and maybe more like 400 years, um, which is maybe more than enough time for for these uh, uh, kind of estuarine environments to stabilize and, and become, um, you know, kind of teeming with oyster reefs and fish and stuff like that. So uh, people settled here, but they couldn't just settle anywhere. They had to find a spot that had the right feng shui. And what I mean by that is they had to um, find places that aligned with the cosmos in certain ways. Um, so. The, the shoreline transgression formed this major um, embayment with the peninsula at the northern end. That's the, the Horseshoe Peninsula. And that southern shore of the peninsula happens to be aligned to the direction of the winter solstice sunset um, from the site. And that's shown here on the, on the right. And then not only that, but features within the site um, share this alignment as well. So there's that freshwater pond and there's sort of a freshwater marsh that um, 
extends from there, and that shoreline is also along the same direction. And then the mounds, which are depicted in, in red in this LIDAR rendering, um, these kind of red blobs here, these are also um, oriented uh, to these same directions. And, um, and those spots were actually elevated before anyone built mounds on them. So um, they actually chose this location to kind of embellish it with, with mound construction on top of those high points. So there are a lot of examples of, of this kind of um, uh, mapping on to particular places that share these uh, important directions. Uh, but I'll just show one more, which is at the Spring Warrior site. So this is kind of a zoomed out uh, LIDAR image showing um, the Spring Warrior uh, Creek. And the Spring Warrior Complex is located right here. And these, uh, these white uh, kind of areas are, are really high ground. And they, they also happen to be oriented to that um, solstice azimuth. So I, you know, we think this is definitely one of the reasons why um, sites were chosen and, and oriented in this way. And then we see here um, simplified maps of, of some of these centers um, with mounds depicted in black. And um, these are also oriented to solstice angles. There's some variation in how the, the azimuth is incorporated into the site plan. Um, but the top, uh, left there is, is Kolomoki, the, the largest site, which is about a, a kilometer in extent. And then the bottom left is Garden Patch. And these are nearly identical. There's a, a few little um, variations, uh, but they're mostly just different scales. And I, I've argued before that Garden Patch, because it starts a little bit earlier, uh, may have been sort of the inspiration for what eventually was built at Kolomoki. Um, and then at other sites, um, the mounds uh, are oriented in other ways, and, and the mounds themselves are, are oriented. So on the right there is, is the platform mound and an adjacent mound at, um, at Garden Patch that, that shares a different solstice alignment. So we've learned that at many of these sites, um, they, they actually begin as cemeteries, uh, and there's some building construction and, and probably some feasting that happens before um, there were permanent villages. Um, and so these were initially kind of vacant sites where people gathered um, and they, they later became villages. Um, so this is a picture uh, on the right here of an excavation in Mound 5 at Garden Patch in 2013. And what we did here was we re-excavated a trench that a, a graduate student in the late 1960s at UF had excavated. He never finished his thesis and, and a lot of the documentation was lost. And so we went in to re-excavate that trench and record the profiles of, of his excavation and, and try to get some datable material to understand the construction of the mound. So um, this plan view on the left uh, shows the locations of some features. Lo and behold, in this, in this re-excavation, we found evidence of post holes where there used to be a structure. And so this plan view uh, gives a, a view of um, where these features are located, where posts used to be. And um, it, because of the nature of this excavation, we don't really know the, the shape or, or size of this building, but it seems like it's, if it is one building, it's, it's more than four meters across, um, which is uh, pretty large for the time period for a domestic structure, and so it, it could be a, a communal building. We also encountered a, a burial at, at one end of this, this trench um, into the original ground surface. Um, so this is this, this cemetery aspect. Um, and, and of course, we left that in place and, um, and uh, refilled this trench. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a view of what these uh, look like in profile. So all of these dark stains here are, are what's left from posts that used to be in the ground. And, and then there's actually a pit that was dug into that surface um, at some point later. And there's uh, at least three major strata um, deposited in, in that pit. And um, so these posts date to 300 AD. They, they penetrate into the original ground surface. So this is kind of the earliest um, major activity at the site. Um, and what we've realized is that uh, this is not kind of a, um, a one-off event. Uh, there's actually some other examples. So um, here's one example from a site that's um, just a little bit south on Sherd Island. 
And um, so back in 1952, uh, UF professor John Goggin did some excavations in what's called the Hughes Island Mound. And, um, and this was a, a site that was, that was never reported on, but um, we do have some documentation. Uh, and about a decade ago, um, Rachel Ionelli was working on her MA thesis and found this profile, and it, it's sort of uh, amazing to see that it, it's almost identical to what I just showed you at the Garden Patch site. So there's uh, a series of post holes dug into the original ground surface, and then there's a pit dug into those, uh, that surface uh, towards the north. So I, you know, I think um, this is uh, some kind of initiation ceremony that's, that's repeated. Um, over time. Um, so something similar might have been happening further north. Now we're going up to Perry uh, at the Spring Warrior site, and this is a, a nice LIDAR image um, that shows in detail uh, the five mounds. You can also see in Mound E and, and Mound A there the, um, the major um, pits that have been dug um, through illicit digging. And, um, and there's some some other interesting features at the site, the midden is actually vi visible um, in the, the LIDAR image. And uh, I think the orientation of this site actually follows uh, some of this solstice alignment as well, sort of um, like a, a football field turned at an angle to the solstice, uh, the way that it's oriented. And this site is also similar to the garden patch site. It's sort of the same configuration, a platform mound facing three uh, other mounds, but it's just sort of turned at a, at a different angle here. So the red dot uh, is where we're gonna go next. And um, we did a shovel test survey across this site and, and we located what we thought was um, some shell midden, but it turned out instead to be uh, one of these post holes. And so um, the construction of um, this post hole is, is kind of um, unusual for a few reasons. One is the, um, the density of the oyster shell that was intentionally emplaced in, in it. Um, oftentimes there's oyster shell in, in post holes, but often it's sort of um, wound up there um, because there's, uh, there's shell around that area of the site. But, but here um, there is no other shell um, in this part of the site. It's, it's brought in maybe as a footer kind of for support um, of the post. We can actually see where we think is a gap in the shell where the post uh, once was. Um, you can see that sort of in the top third of the, of the figure there. Um, so last year, um, we went back and uh, tried to find more of these posts. Um, and here's another example uh, on the right here. Uh, and for a class paper, um, one of my PhD students, Ashley Rakowski, um, compiled dimension and shape data of contemporaneous posts at various sites around the region. And what's unusual about these spring warrior posts uh, is that uh, a lot of them are really deep. So some of them extend um, up to a meter deep, uh, whereas you know, most woodland posts are, are 30 centimeters or so deep. Um, and then another interesting aspect of uh, the configuration of these posts. So you can see in the top, uh, top left here uh, is the, maybe what could be the outline of a structure, although it's kind of risky with um, only what would be a, a small portion of, of the structure. If this configuration is, is correct, as I'm depicting in, in the kind of red dashed line, then it would be a structure that's 20 meters wide. Um, and that's not completely unheard of for this time period. Um, recently, Victor Thompson and colleagues um, published a paper about um, a woodland site called Cold Springs in central Georgia, and there's some, some really big structures there that they call council houses that are 12 meters, 14 meters um, wide. So maybe you know, this, this kind of structure is, is some kind of large building like that, and, it's, uh, and it dates remarkably to the same time as the structure that I showed you at Garden Patch underneath Mound 5 to about 300 AD. Okay, so how were these villages organized? I'm gonna to touch on this just a little bit. So this is um, a, a map rendering of, of kind of results of a, of a shovel test survey, and it, it's showing um, 
we dug every 20 meters across this site, and then we can interpolate the density of different kinds of, of artifacts. So this is showing you the, the counts of pottery sherds in each of these shovel tests. And you can kind of make out here, um, there's in the center of the site kind of a C-shaped distribution, and that's the, um, that's the, the midden of the initial village. And we know from, from the survey and also from pretty extensive test excavations and radiocarbon dating um, how this site uh, began and, and how it evolved. So there was a small occupation uh, in the first couple centuries AD. This is following that initial um, shoreline transgression and formation of that marsh. Um, but it wasn't until about uh, the early 300s AD where we see that, that village form and it kind of forms all at once, it seems like, and then it lasts for 300 years, really, without any uh, visible hiatus. The mounds, uh, at least two of the mounds, are, are constructed during this time period, um, and maybe all of the mounds were constructed then. Um, we're not really sure. Um, and then everybody leaves in the 600s, um, and I'm gonna come back to that in a, in a little bit. Um, we find a, a pretty big diversity of, um, of different kinds of pottery during this time period at, at this site and in this region. So there's different kinds of tempers of pottery, limestone, sand, sponge spicules. There's a lot of different surface treatments, cord marking, fabric impressed, complicated stamping. Um, and what's one of the remarkable things about uh, Garden Patch and, and probably other sites is that there doesn't seem to be much differentiation in different areas of the, of the midden. Uh, everyone's kind of doing the same thing um, throughout those, those 300 years. And that kind of goes for the faunal assemblages as well. Um, at Spring Warrior, moving to, up to Perry again, uh, we have a similar kind of configuration. Um, this is only two thirds of the survey that we did, um, showing pottery again. We now know that the, after we completed the survey last year, the, the configuration of, of the village is kind of a, a J shape. Um, and we don't have quite as many um, radiocarbon dates yet from the site but we can look at diagnostic pottery, temporally diagnostic pottery. So the complicated stamp pottery that has these kind of scalloped or notched rims, like are shown here on the, on the left-hand side, uh, these are, are pre kind of AD 600. And so if we, we map out where those things occur, then we get an idea of maybe where the, um, where the early village was that corresponds to the early village at Garden Patch. Uh, and then we'll see that later on in time, um, the rest of the site was occupied. And then in terms of, uh, of what people were doing to make a living, they're eating tons of fish, uh, especially mullet, but there's 70 different taxa that are represented. Um, Haley Singleton analyzed the faunal assemblage uh, from some garden patch test excavations for her master's thesis. And so she found this really broad spectrum kind of diet. Um, and they. Uh, this is an example of, of one of the test units that she excavated, and it's really nicely stratified. It goes from about 300 AD up to about 600 AD at this location. Um, and they even ate a, um, a lot of toadfish, which have a face that only a mother could love. Um, they're not eating that much today. Um, and there are some changes through time that I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, and then. Haley compared that village assemblage to the Mound 2 assemblage, the platform mound, um, and, and it's, it's quite a bit different. And we actually know a lot about this mound um, because we've done uh, 20 square meters of excavation into it. Um, and we also did some remote sensing uh, with Victor Thompson, which is um, shown on the, on the right here. Those kind of red and, and yellow areas are, are dense lenses of shell that show up in, in ground penetrating radar. So we have these kind of um, intervening uh, lenses of shell and sand uh, in this mound. And, um, and then with uh, Isabel Lulowitz, we, we also did um, oxygen isotope studies of the oyster shell. So cold water is, is isotopically heavier than warm water. And so by comparing uh, the last growth increment to prior growth, we can reliably understand the season of capture of, of each individual shell. So we did 10 in, in the mound and, 
and nine out of the 10 fall in either winter or fall. And the only shell that's definitively summer uh, is actually from the, an upper um, stratum that is a, a, it's sand that's, that's you know, redeposited from somewhere else. So we can kind of maybe explain that one away. Um, we didn't have good village oyster samples for this study, um, but we know at Crystal River where they compared village and, and mound samples, Crystal River is south of Garden Patch uh, down in Citrus County, um, that the, the midden has um, all year round capture of oyster, whereas the mounds is mostly um, cold water <clears throat> associated with, with cold water. So this leads us to believe that um, the, the mounds are constructed and there's, there's more activities going on around the, the mound in the winter, and maybe that's at the winter solstice. Maybe that's why we have the kind of fall slash winter um, kind of isotopic results. Um, at Shell Mound near Cedar Key, um, Ken Sassman and, and, uh, and his students presented some convincing evidence that um, there might have been a, a summer solstice kind of gathering there because they have certain fauna like um, fledgling white ibis birds that um, uh, maybe indicate that's the time of year when, when people were gathering. So there may be some kind of ritual calendar where people are gathering at, at various centers at, at different times of the year. Um, so the, the winter season is also supported at Garden Patch by, um, by Haley Singleton's faunal analysis, which showed a lot of migratory birds. So there are things like robins and various kinds of ducks and things that um, occur in the mound, and they, they don't occur um, much in the midden, or not as prevalently. Um, and then we, we thought, based on the remote sensing, that there might have been a structure at the top of this platform mound, which would, would have been sort of unexpected. So we opened up um, some block units, and, and it turned out to be um, some interference from modern disturbance and tree roots. But that meant that we had a really big sample from, um, from the, the mound. And so we're pretty confident in, in knowing that this is a different kind of assemblage. At, at the surface, it seems like it could just be, um, or I should say at a surface level, in our understanding, we could interpret it as just redeposited shell and sand. But it's different in terms of the composition of the pottery assemblage. There's lots of non-local pottery. There's fauna that, that doesn't occur in other areas of the site as prevalently. Like they were really going crazy for the toadfish in uh, the mound deposits. There's, there's really tons of them. Um, and so, um, you know, for these reasons, we think th these are a, a lot of what's incorporated into the mound are, um, are feasting deposits. Okay, so third question, how did early villages relate to their peers? Um, and so this gets into an area that I'm, I'm really fond of. Um, you know, early villages are, were autonomous politically. There's really no evidence for um, any kind of like regional political control, but there is ample evidence of connections between sites um, and even maybe integration across considerable distances. Um, and so we have this really unique data set in this region in Swift Creek complicated stamp pottery. Um, and so there were these intricate designs that were carved into wooden paddles. None have, no paddles have ever been discovered, but um, on the bottom left here is what they might have, have looked like. Uh, but of course, they're perishable material, so we, we don't really find them. Um, and we often have just bits and pieces of the whole design, um, but often the designs can be reconstructed from their impressions. And they, they really provide this glimpse of, a, of an artistic tradition that, um, that we wouldn't have if it, if it weren't for the pottery. Um, so some designs depict animals, some uh, are probably faces, uh, like the top left examples here. Um, but the most remarkable aspect of this kind of pottery is that um, each carved paddle was unique. And we can track their uh, their impressions across the landscape. So we can see when pottery vessels at multiple sites were stamped with the same paddle. So they're, they're basically, they can act as maker's marks for, uh, for archaeologists. And so in this example, we have um, part of a design from a single paddle that was used to impress two different vessels um, at sites separated by uh, 20 kilometers. So Letchworth and Block Stearns just west of us here. Um, and so this is a direct connection 
uh, between sites. Some of the best evidence we have of this kind of connection. And it's probably also evidence of contemporaneity, at least at the level of, of maybe a decade or so, if we think that these paddles are relatively um, non-durable. And so that's pretty rare in archaeology. So uh, this kind of trick has been known for a long time, but um, until recently there hasn't been a lot of uh, sort of systematic integration of these kinds of data. Um, so with my colleague Tom Pluck on um, about 14 years ago, we started um, an NSF-sponsored project where we built a database of designs and um, we tied those attributes of design to various vessel attributes like the size and shape of vessels um, and, and uh, paste characteristics of vessels and things like that. And um, so we generated tons of new data from collections. Um, so from all of the sites depicted in yellow on this map, those are, are new data that we collected for this project. And then we compared those to some existing data from the sites in red, and those are design data compiled by just one person, whose name is Frankie Snow, who for 50 years, as a, as a, a personal passion, compiled data from uh, Swift Creek complicated stamp designs. Uh, and so with the resulting data, what we did was a, a formal social network analysis. Um, so each of the matching de designs um, is a tie. And on this map, the size of the square um, is scaled to what's called betweenness centrality, which, which refers to when, when a node acts as a, as a link between other sites that, are, that wouldn't be connected otherwise. So what we found was that um, there are connections among sites that are, the, the mean uh, distance of connection was over 100 kilometers, um, but there's certainly some that are a lot closer and some that are more distant. And we also found that civic ceremonial centers, these sites that I've been talking about, um, are the most prominent sites in the network. So they, they seem to have high betweenness values, um, and those are represented by the biggest red squares here. Um, so they, they serve as bridges between other kinds of sites. So we also wanted to know if we could kind of identify separate interaction communities within this network. Um, and so we use what's called a Gervin Newman community detection. Uh, and, and that basically progressively removes the ties that have the greatest between this value. And that's gonna lead to um, greater kind of modularity and so what we see is that there are these clusters of interaction. Um, so there's, there's one on the Atlantic coast. There's really only one site that connects um, all these Atlantic coast sites to the interior. Um, there's another cluster that's sort of on the, the northern Okmulgee River. But there's one outlier here at the Shelley Mound, which is um, near Tallahassee. Um, there's another cluster on the southern Okmulgee River. Uh, and sites like Kolomoki are um, are affiliated with that cluster. And then the Gulf Coast kind of has its, its own kind of cluster of interaction there too. Um, and so, you know, one, one thing we've kind of realized is that there are these kind of separate um, clusters of interaction that are, are really only tied to each other through these civic ceremonial centers. They're, they're kind of the, um, the glue in the region. So if we want to understand how these places are connected, one of the problems with the paddle matching designs is that they don't show us directionality necessarily. Uh, there's just, there's, um, we don't know if someone moved from one site to the, to the other or vice versa. Um, but when we source the pottery, we can see um, what the trends are. So we've, we've looked at about 800 sherds of complicated stamp pottery and compared it to about 150 clay samples. And, um, and we can, through geochemistry and through petrographic analysis looking at the mineral inclusions, we can uh, kind of infer these regions of, um, of source composition for pottery and identify that when, when pots are located far from their original source. And what we see is that um, there's a ton of pottery that was transported out of southwestern Georgia, probably near, from near Kolomoki, in the lower Chattahoochee River. Uh, and 
there, there's really, there's pottery moving kind of in all directions, but that is definitely the predominant kind of direction. Um, and we find that uh, actually the, the most non-local pottery occurs at burial mounds and also in middens at uh, civic ceremonial centers. So those are really the, the sites that are connected the most and they seem like they're, they're most well connected to maybe Kolomoki or um, sites nearby. Okay, so why did these early villages uh, ever decline or, or transform? So what we see at Garden Patch, going back to Horseshoe Beach, is that in, in the 600s, we see a gap in the occupation. And then we see people come back uh, probably in the, uh, the early 700s. And when they come back, they bring with them this new, totally new pottery assemblage. Um, it looks very different. It's kind of the classic, what archaeologists call site unit intrusion, where um, you know, they look kind of unrecognizable compared to people before. Uh, and this is part of um, the, the Whedon Island tradition where there's all kinds of uh, incised patterns and punctated patterns. Um, and the other thing they do is that they settle only on the western end of the site in an area that was not occupied previously. And they really don't set foot on um, the rest of the site as far as we can tell from archaeological evidence except for to uh, place things in the mounds uh, like burials and, um, and funerary offerings. So it, the, the, the old village kind of becomes um, sort of the land of the dead, it seems like. And at other later sites, like at, at Moundville in Alabama, uh, there's a phenomenon that archaeologists refer to as a, a necropolis, where uh, people aren't really living at the site, but they're, but, you know, they're, they're putting a lot of, of burials and, and holding ceremonies there. And that seems to be the case for this village, although, of course, people are living right next to it. They're not they're not really doing anything uh, domestic on, t on top of the, the former village site. So we see um, a similar phenomenon of people moving when they come back, um, moving to a different area of the site at Spring Warrior. Um, but it, this is a different kind of pattern in the sense that the, the post 600 AD arrangement uh, shows a much larger population. Um, than at Garden Patch, seems much larger than the pre-AD 600 village. So um, even though there's some patterns here, there's also some differences. So why did people uh, seem to pick up and move and, and where did they go? Well, in terms of why, uh, that, that's, that's sort of, um, I think, tricky to, to figure out. But one thing we can look at is the vertebrate faunal data. And we have pretty good temporal resolution on this. So on the left here, this figure is showing uh, animal class through time. So you have mammals and birds and reptiles and so on. And the green line there is fish. And that is tending to decline starting um, at the beginning of the occupation and going into that abandonment. Uh, and meanwhile, reptiles, which includes uh, a lot of turtles, uh, that's increasing substantially. And then when people abandon the site and when they come back, there's, there's much fewer reptiles and there's uh, much more fish. And, and that actually maps onto uh, what we know sort of, of the greater climate where we're moving into this period called the Vandal Minimum, which is, um, which is cooler and drier generally. And so these, these freshwater turtles, which account for most of this um, kind of reptile line here, those drop out of the assemblage in a, in a major way and sort of, sort of uh, reflect that drought, we think. And then meanwhile, mammals, which is mostly deer, um, you can barely see this blue line because it's not a major part of the, um, the vertebrate assemblage. That declines through time and, and never really recovers. So at Spring Warrior, we actually see some of the same trends. We don't have good temporal control yet, but with the complicated stamp pottery, we can try to mimic temporal control because Complicated stamp pottery declines through time. And so if we actually compare complicated stamp pottery and the percentage of mammals and fishes, uh, and this figure here, you can't see my cursor. On the figure on the right, um, the top one, uh, actually both of these have chronology moving from right to left <laughs> instead of left to right. Sorry about that. But basically, uh, the top is showing how fish decline through time 
and then they jump up uh, tremendously when there's not much complicated stamp pottery. And then on the bottom here, mammals decline and never recover, um, just as they do at, at Garden Patch. Okay, so if people are leaving then, where are they going? Well, we see up at Kolomoki in southwest Georgia, there's a major population expansion at this time. So on the bottom left of these four uh, figures here, the gray is showing the areas of, um, of Midden. And so the Midden area gets the biggest during this period around the 600s into the 700s AD. And, um, and this is a time uh, when my colleagues, uh, Tom Pluckon and, and, uh, and Sean West, say the village is hypertrophic. It's become a, a sort of bigger than, uh, than can be useful. So you can imagine a kilometer wide village site um, with a central plaza and there can be no communication across that kind of area the way there would be in a more intimate, smaller kind of village. Um, and we actually know that, um, that some of these areas of the village are different than others. So the northern part seems like it was occupied year round. The southern part um, might have been only seasonally occupied ba based on uh, different kinds of uh, flora. There's different artifact assemblages as well. So one of the interpretations is actually that the, the southern kind of arc of Midden is related to um, newcomers that might have come from the south when these other civic ceremonial centers are being abandoned. And we actually see that in the radiocarbon dating. These on the right here are um, summed probabilities of um, calibrated radiocarbon dates. And they, they show that there's this gap in southern sites, which, which start further south on the bottom of this figure. Uh, while there's a gap there, uh, after about 550, 600 AD, there's actually a surge of population at the more northern sites, including at, at Kolomoki. So it seems like that's where people went. And then when there's uh, kind of a decline in population at Kolomoki, there's a, um, a reoccupation of these southern sites um, on the northern Gulf Coast, like Garden Patch and at um, Spring Warrior. And when people come back, we think that the, some of the origins of, uh, of this Whedon Island pottery style that I mentioned in that western part of, of Garden Patch, the origins of it uh, might be at Kolomoki or nearby somewhere in the lower Chattahoochee, maybe in the Apalachicola. Uh, that's where it seems to date earliest and it dates a little later, further south, the further south you go. Uh, but there's also this distribution of pottery where things like the effigy vessels, uh, the, the, the faces and the, the vessels that are shaped into the form of animals. Um, these vessels, a lot of them seem like they were made in, in the area of Kolomoki or nearby, and they're distributed uh, out from there. Um, a student worked with me some years ago, Dominique um, Ceresso, uh, compiling um, records of effigy vessels, Wheaton Island effigy vessels, and, and mapping their distributions. And so this is a map from that work, and, and it shows you know, the broad distribution of um, this kind of tradition of effigy vessels. And a lot of those we know based on sourcing evidence were made um, further north and inland. Okay, and then um, another sort of indication of, of changes here. Um, when people uh, migrated back into some of these coastal villages, uh, they were doing things differently, and one of the things it seems like they weren't doing as often is they weren't having feasts, and they certainly weren't building mounds as often anymore. And we've actually compiled um, size data on temporally diagnostic pottery, and what we've been able to show is that uh, vessels become smaller between what's known as the middle woodland, which is this earlier period of village occupation when they're building mounds and, and have this you know, very... Um, kind of organized village around a plaza, and then the late woodland when they have the Whedon Island kind of pottery and they're, um, they're not organized around these plazas at these reoccupied civic ceremonial centers. So what this might indicate at an aggregate level is that the reason why the mean uh, pottery size declines through time is because people aren't um, supplying feasts as often. They're not holding feasts for um, people beyond their sort of uh, domestic uh, group, their household. Um, so that's sort of the emerging story of, uh, of early villages on the northern Gulf Coast. 
uh, and beyond. And um, I'm happy to take some questions, but I also want to thank all my collaborators and uh, especially the students that have worked with me over the years. Um, they, they dig most of the holes and also have to fill them back in. Thank you.